Well, hello. Many of you will remember the Midas story and how he lost, uh, he lost his, his will to have everything that he touched turned to gold. Uh, and you could say that what he was really looking for was a balance. And um, that's the sort of balance that, that Midas was looking for because he was able, he was looking for a way of balancing uh, the natural resources that supported his food and drink that had previously been turned to gold uh, and the social resources that were represented by his daughter who had also been turned to gold, um, balancing them with the economic resources, the economic capital um, that he was previously so fond of. Uh, that, the fact that he engaged in that balancing act 2,800 years ago, um, I think can earn him the title of the inventor of multi-capitalism. Um, I'm sure he wouldn't have recognised the term at the time, but using multiple capitals instead of just economic capital as uh, a source of inspiration and motivation as to what you should be doing in life. Now our story begins with the breaking news that we have a, a new CEO appointed. Christine Dupont has been named as CEO of ABC Foods Incorporated. This is a, a New England based foods company and um, as she's appointed, she knows the company pretty well, the first thing on her mind is how the hell am I going to balance all these things? I've got 25,000 tonnes of greenhouse gases that we're producing every year. We've got a return on equity which is 6.5% which the shareholders don't think is enough and uh, the one good thing is that we've got an innovation index of 801 and we're really good at innovation. So um, that's th those were her, her thoughts at the start and she had a little bit of advice from Thomas and McElroy about um, the context-based multi-capitalism approach in which she needed to ask three questions. First of all, what represents a sustainable performance in our context for each of those components of the triple bottom line? Secondly, how do we perform against them? And thirdly, what do we do about it? And the context-based approach to that starts with answering that first question of what's the norm? What represents a sustainable impact for our business to have on all of those, each of those capitals? And the process is the same for each one. We identify the normative impacts. So you use science and the best evidence available to say what should your impact be or not be on each of the various bits of each of those capitals. You then determine who are the responsible populations for doing it because you can't expect one organisation to put right all the wrongs of the world. And thirdly, you allocate a share of duties to them which represents their standard of what they consider to be a context-based sustainability norm, which of course only works if everyone else in the rest of the world does their bit and that's what we call the fair shares principle. Um, the standard represents your fair share of what's got to be done in a usually unsustainable world. Well, she started off by getting this, the multiple scorecard set up for 2015. And I don't know whether you can read that chart, but with the, the bottom lines are horizontal on this. And in the social bottom line, you can see that she identified three areas of impact. Um, a living wage, workplace safety, innovative capacity. In the uh, economic bottom line, she was thinking of a return on equity, of um, dealing with borrowings and competitive practices that impact upon other people's economic well-being. And in the environmental sphere, the areas of impact were water supplies, solid waste disposal and the climate system. So those are the 
areas of impact, those are the groupings of the triple bottom line, and you'll see there's some numbers on there as well. And if you look at the first column of innovative capacity, you'll see that it's got a score of six. The next column says the maximum possible score is six. That represents a 100% score. So that 100% means that they are in that year, in respect of that area of impact, sustainable. And that's what she thought when she took the job on. Um, but we're able now to take a leap forward to 2020, look back with 2020 hindsight at what happened over those four years, four years of change, five years in all. And you can see that innovative capacity was doing extraordinarily well in, two, in 2015 um, and not so well for the rest of the period. How do you measure innovative capacity in that particular company? They've got a, 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 a a compound index which takes into account uh, the ranking of the organization in recruiting top researchers, the number of hours that people spend on innov innovation, the projects that come into the innovation funnel and the projects that come out of the innovation funnel and the quality of facilities and the last component of that um, compound indicator is the number of projects that they're running with local universities. So it's a pretty good indicator of innovative capacity and as you can see in 2016 it was a disaster. Um, a new organisation set up in the neighbourhood, they recruited some of the researchers from ABC, they took some of the top people from the local university and that minus one score in 2016 means that they went backwards. They destroyed capital. That particular sort of social capital, in any case, went backwards in that year. They'd already determined in 2015 that they needed to grow their innovative capacity at 5% per annum to be sustainable. Um, so they then set their target to recover that 5% per annum growth by 2019 and they failed actually, although they increased incredibly each year, they just fell below the trajectory target and that gives them a score of one out of three. So that's a 33% progression score. When it came to equity, uh, they were below the target of what the shareholders were looking for. They determined that what would be enough as a, as a, as a capital creation in the equity field would be the opportunity cost of capital expressed on the invested uh, capital and that turned out at 10% per annum validated with uh, market analysis and they believed they would only be sustainable in the long run if they were generating more income than their cost of capital employed. So that set their sustainability norm at 10%. Uh, they've got a trajectory target to get there uh, which gives, which, and they hit that in 2016 and 17, which gives them a, a, a two out of three score. Fell back in 2018, there was a storm, they made no improvement in profits, but they met, they met their trajectory target in, in 2019. I should have said that that plan for the trajectory was negotiated by Christine and her board with the equity stakeholders because they needed a plan and enabled them to invest in the innovative capacity while still driving their profitability up to meet the, meet the sustainability norm. And then with the climate system, 25,000 tonnes of greenhouse gases at the outset, they knew that was unsustainable. That gives them a zero score. Um, they looked at the uh, climate change scenarios to try and find something that was scientifically based that would represent an, a, 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 um, an, an achievable uh, trajectory and they found the IPCC's 2.6 scenario brought them back to something like zero emissions for 2000 and 2100 which seemed like a very long way away. By the time they got working on it in 2016 they found that they could set a target of zero 
emissions by 2030, which they did. So they were on target, those scores of, of, of two out of three represent 66% scores, and that's what they were achieving, uh, um, uh, hitting the trajectory target to get to sustainability. So that, when you look back, when she looked back at her, at her five years of, uh, of, of managing the business in 2019, you could, she, could, she could show enormous improvements in, ma in many areas, in particular in economic and environmental uh, 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 bottom lines. She'd achieved that with the negotiation, the, the engaging with stakeholders to sort out what could be done and by setting sustainability targets for all of those areas. You'll see that there are four 100% on there. That means they are fully sustainable. There are four at 67% on there, which means that they are on target but not yet sustainable. And the one that was still failing was the uh, innovative capacity score, which I talked about. This scorecard was reviewed by Professor Ian Thompson at Harriet Watt University. Um, 25 years a researcher in measuring sustainability performance metrics and uh, he said and I quote him and he's being quoted with his approval I've been thinking about whether there's a better way to measure sustainability performance and he said I've come to the conclusion there isn't context is critical I believe he said that a key, a vital capital for an organisation should be to be able to implement and run a multi-capital scorecard. So that, for me, was a tremendous endorsement of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the process and the mechanics of calculation that we'd sorted out with him. It's uh, a unique, absolutely new uh, approach to measuring sustainability performance. Um, it, you will hear of integrated reporting and when you do please know that this is the only context-based in in, in uh, integrative approach to integrated reporting and it will become a norm and when it does just remember that you heard it here with the change leaders first. Thank you.